Good morning, everyone. Um, just to throw it out there, I clearly did not get the brief that the background was going to be red, so um, <laughs> I just blend in. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you, hopefully, a different lens on trust. And the idea I'd like to explore with you today is that a lot of change that's happening in the world can actually be understood through the lens of trust. And the idea is that we are moving from an age built on institutional trust to one that is built on distributed trust. So just to give me a feel for everyone in the room, I'd like you to raise your hands if you are a host on Airbnb. Okay, that is really easy to count because it's zero. Um, is anyone a guest on Airbnb? So about 50 people. Um, has anyone hired a lawyer through UpCouncil? Again, very easy to count, zero. Um, does anyone own Bitcoin? That's amazing, four people. Um, I was going to ask you who uses Tinder, but I, I'm reading the audience, so <laughs> um, I'll stay away from that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to explain how these ideas are connected by this new world of trust that I think is very important for leaders to understand because it actually explains patterns of disruption. Um, just to take you a step back, at the beginning of my journey, I want to introduce you to sort of a pioneer of trust in this new world. Now, the wonderful thing about my work is I get to learn about the origins of companies. I'm really fascinated by why things start in the world, where they come from. And one of the companies that I was studying and got deep inside was the world of eBay. Now, some of you may have heard the story that eBay started by Pierre Emidia was to help his girlfriend buy and sell Pez dispensers. So you probably all know those, those things where candy pops out their mouth. Well, this is actually a myth, and it was made up by the communications team of eBay because the true story they decided was too geeky. Um, the true story is that Pierre uh, put this broken laser pointer up on his own website uh, as an experiment. And he wanted to see if there was anyone in the world that would bid on this broken laser pointer. Even he was surprised. In 24 hours, he received a bid for $13.83. So he wrote to the gentleman. He said, you do realize that this laser pointer is broken. And the gentleman wrote back and said, I am a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> it's a dead true story. <laughs> the basis of a multi-billion dollar company. Now, I find this really, story really interesting because it is the basis of many marketplaces. And for the last eight years, I've really been studying this first piece. Um, I've really been studying how technology creates the efficiency to match millions of haves with millions of wants in ways that transform the way we think about supply and demand. And this has become the basis of the so-called sharing economy or collaborative economy. But through this work, the piece that has really stuck with me is trust how technology is changing the way human beings can trust one another. And we are just in the nascent stages of really understanding that in, uh, relationship. But eBay is interesting, right? Because eBay is quite a safe world of this online trust because many people have pseudonyms. So I remember distinctly, I went to my dad, he's a chartered accountant, and I said, I want to buy a secondhand car on eBay, and he said, the guy's name is Haunted Wizard. This really isn't a very good idea. Um, the point is that transactions were anonymous and transactions stayed online. Now, if we fast forward 10 years, something phenomenal is happening. So these are the three founders of Airbnb. This is when I first met them towards the end of 2007, start of 2008. They do not look like that now. Um, it's Brian, Joe, and Nate. And I came back from meeting these guys, and I told my husband, He's a barrister. We have very different uh, lens on the world. And I said to him, I've just met the next Facebook. I've just met the next eBay. We should take all our money, and we should invest in these guys. So he said, well, what are they doing? And I said, well, they started this company where they got these air mattresses, and they blew them up. And then people around the world could book these air mattresses. And their idea now is to make any room in the world as easy to book as a hotel. 
And he looked at me and he's, you know, he's like, have you lost your marbles? Because like, he's like, so people are going to take photographs of their homes, their bathrooms, their bedrooms, and then they're going to invite strangers from all around the world to stay in them. And you think this is a really good idea. And I said, yeah, because technology is changing trust. And he made a really good point to his credit. So what he said was, this is different from eBay, Rachel, because if you think about eBay, the transactions stay online. And when you're talking about Airbnb, the transactions are face to face, that we're using the internet to trust people in the physical world. Now, he was really wrong, right? Because um, Airbnb is now this incredible marketplace. And the thing that I love about it, and that often isn't talked about, is they were brilliant, not in recognizing just holiday homes, but that all kinds of assets in the world, TPs, igloos, airplane hangers, had this capacity. And they created a marketplace for things that never had a market before. And what's astonishing about Airbnb, and I have to say, this is on our fridge. So whenever my husband points out that I am wrong, I point to the valuation of Airbnb, because they are now the most second uh, valuable hospitality brand in the world. If you actually look at it through a different lens, they are now the most valuable hospitality brand in the world. And the reason why this is so powerful is you can see why, how Airbnb is going to get to the top within the next 18 months. And it illustrates the area that I now study, which is how there's this new currency emerging in the world, and how there's this new currency of trust between strangers that is the basis of these multi-billion dollar marketplaces. So I am writing a book on trust, and I'm going to try and synthesize um, about 80,000 words into five minutes. Um, I'm going to try and give you a macro view on the natural history of trust. And the good thing is that it's actually very simple to understand. There have only been three big trust shifts in the entire evolution of society. So the way trust works for um, economic transactions and for people to trust one another. So the first phase lasted a long time. It's something that I call local trust. Um, and that's because it was based on small-knit communities, market-based towns. So if I wanted to buy a bread, I might buy it from Jeff here, and he might say, how's your kids? And if I wanted a loan, I might ask for Vec. And if I didn't pay him back, you would all know that I was completely dodgy, and I would get a bad reputation, and no one would do business with me. So trust was local, it was human, it was face-to-face, -face, um, and it was often based on reputation. And this really lasted all the way through to the late 18th century, when the world went through a phenomenal amount of change. You know, so people they moved to big cities like San Francisco, um, out of small villages. We started paying this strange thing called income tax. Uh, we started reading the New York Times. But most importantly, we stopped, for the most large part, um, interacting with local markets. And we started to interact with faceless corporations. They didn't know who I was as an individual. And this is when trust became institutional. Uh, measures of trust were largely in sort of black box systems, things like legal contracts, insurance, regulation. And then trust became big. It became permission-based. Now, what's happening, and my theory, is that part of the reason why we feel so much disruption and change is that we are in the nascent stages of the third biggest trust shift in the entire evolution of man. And then what's happening is that we're moving from an age of institutional trust, built on these hierarchical, top-down institutions, to a world of distributed trust. Trust is actually returning directly between individuals, and it's the way trust works in networks and marketplaces. So when you read a lot of the media, and you read the literature and the theory behind this, the reason is often pointed to the collapse of institutional trust, right? So people are talking about that trust is declining in banks and trust is declining in newspapers. Um, and you see lots of studies like this. This is from um, Gallup, who they do a study every single year where they ask Americans, um, how much do you trust? How much confidence do you have in these institutions? And for the first time in history, trust has declined in every single category. So when you read these studies, what they point to is major breaches of institutional trust. So things like the Volkswagen emission scandal, um, the News Corp phone hacking, uh, the Panama Papers. And it's really easy to conclude that trust is changing because 
we no longer trust um, elites and we no longer trust the reputations of leaders. And I think this is the case, but something more interesting is happening. And what is interesting that is happening is that institutional trust was not designed for the digital age. Institutional trust was designed for organizations in a world that looked like this. And this isn't the world that we're operating in. So if you look at the characteristics of institutional trust, one of the things that leaders have to get their heads around is that they've been designed to build brands, lead organizations that are built on the characteristics on the left. Organizations that could have been opaque, that you couldn't see inside everything that that organization was doing. They weren't expected to operate in transparent ways. That this type of trust was closed, and it was linear, and it was easy control, that it was hierarchical, that it was permission-based. And this is being blown up into this new world where trust is transparent, and it's networked, and it's accountability-based, and it can no longer be tightly controlled. So just before I take you into that new world, let's just stop and think about what trust really means. I find it fascinating. There are three words, I think, in the business language that are the most overused and abused words. Innovation, disruption, and trust, right? It is phenomenal. People talk about trust all the time. But when you stop and ask people, what does trust really mean, is incredibly difficult to define. And it's interesting that trust is actually the most debated sociological concept. We cannot agree on the definition of trust. But if you look at thousands of definitions of trust, it usually comes down to some kind of risk assessment that people make. The risk assessment of how likely it is that things will go right, that this will have some kind of positive interaction or outcome if I interact with this person, this thing, or this company. So it's the likelihood that things will go right. And the interesting thing about this assessment is that we apply it hundreds of times a day in big and small ways in our lives. So just to give you a few examples of the range, you know, my, I have a four-year-old son, and he, this isn't him, um, but he, um, he doesn't like being photographed. Uh, my daughter loves being photographed, but not my son. But anyway, um, he likes to go to sleep at night with the light on. And we have this very small trust game where I say to him, I trust you to play with your Lego and turn off the light in half an hour. I'm taking a risk that he will turn off the light. I can't be sure of that outcome, but the likelihood of it is high. Trust also works in big ways. I trusted the pilot that took me from Chicago to Florida that he would get here safely. And trust also works in getting us to take leaps to try unknown things, right? So for me to get in a self-driving car, I need to make an assessment that will actually get me around OK. So trust is really interesting. Trust is a really interesting way of understanding how you take people from something that is unknown to something that is known. Right? When you look at many things in the world, when they move from something that is unknown to something that is known, trust is what takes you over that gap. And the interesting thing is that technology is really good at reducing that gap between the unknown and known. So let me give you an example of this working in an extreme way. Can you raise your hands if you were told as a child never to get in a car with a stranger? Most of this audience, I distinctly remember this conversation. Never get in a car with a stranger. We had a code word. It was green tomato. If someone, um, like if mum couldn't get there and she was stuck at work and someone strange would be picking me up that I wasn't expecting, green tomato was the code word. So I find this astonishing that this is something we've told. And yet there is a startup in France. It's now in India and Mexico. It's growing very fast all around the world called Blah Blah Car. And it's built on this exact principle. It's different from Uber. What it does is it matches people on long distance rides. So say I'm driving from Chicago to San Francisco. Um, it will match people, drivers and passengers, going similar destinations around the same time. And the interesting thing about this platform is that people have social profiles. So if any of you are LinkedIn or Facebook, you have social profiles that contain the information that is really important for someone to make a decision as to whether they want to share. Every ride is over 200 kilometers. So you better make a good decision, right? So this is John. 
He's pretty typical. He will share what kind of music he, he likes. So are you going to listen to Nirvana? Are you going to listen to Coldplay? He shares whether he's going to bring his dog along for the ride. He shares whether he's going to smoke in the car. But the really interesting thing is when you dig into the research of Blah Blah Car, the most important social identifier is how much you're going to talk in the car. So if you're not going to talk a lot, you say you're blah. If you're going to talk a little bit, you're blah, blah. And if you're not going to stop talking all the way from Chicago to San Francisco, you are blah, 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 which is where the name comes from. Now, I know this idea seems slightly out there, but just to put this into perspective, blah, blah, car, an idea built on sharing a car with a stranger, now transports more than 4 million people every single month. That is more than the Eurostar. It's more than Delta Airlines. It's more than Delta Airlines. The blah, blah, car chats more people every single month than Delta Airlines. Now, this is really interesting to me because what it illustrates is people using technology to take what I call a trust leap. And a trust leap is when we take the risk to do something new or different from the way we've done it before. And the reason why I think trust leaps are so interesting is that the pace that we're willing to take these trust leaps, the amount of information that we need to make these kinds of leaps is happening much faster. This is why we're seeing behavior change. This is why we're seeing the adoption of all these new kinds of ideas. So I was really interested in how this works. How does trust work in this new world? Does it work in the same way that I trust Nike or that I trust PwC? So I decided to study trust interactions in over 350 of these weird and wonderful platforms. And this is what I saw, that there is actually a pattern people follow. So in the first instance, they have to trust the idea. So if you think about Blah Blah Car or Airbnb, um, you have to trust that the idea of ride sharing, sharing a car with a stranger, is worth it, and it's safe, and it's worth taking the risk. Next thing, which is really interesting, is rather than trusting the company per se, you have to trust the platform. And this is really interesting. There's a whole new world. It's, I think there's going to be a whole new business language and culture around platforms. So you have to trust that if something goes wrong, Airbnb or blah, blah, car, whatever the platform is, they will be there to solve the problem and carry the risk. And the third layer, which is really, really interesting, is how you make decisions to trust the other user. How do you make decisions how you're going to trust that other individual? And that's what I want to focus on. So, Let's do a little bit of an experiment, a little bit of an energizer. I know you've been sitting there quite a long time. Please don't panic. It's going to be OK, right? So um, I want you, some of you have your phones in your hands, but I want you to, everyone's get out their phone. And I want you to unlock it. Now take a deep breath and give it to the person sitting next to you. If you're on the end, you're going to have to do a multi-way swap. I can see if you're swapping, by the way. It's very bright up here. <laughs> Has everyone swapped? OK. You now have 25 seconds to play with that person's phone. <laughs> no, no, you have to do this. You have to do this. <laughs> We're only at 10 seconds. You have 15 more seconds to go. <laughs> OK. Do you know what's really interesting about this is some of the things I always uh, observe doing this. There's some people who want to keep going, keep going. <laughs> um, some people absolutely refuse. Shh. Some people absolutely refuse. I am not doing this. This is a total invasion of my privacy, and I fully respect that. Other people, most of us, experience our heart rate go up just a little bit, right? This mild sense of panic. And then you see these really, do you mind if I touch your Twitter account? Like, you know, people asking for permission. You can give the phones back, right? Now, the interesting thing is that very short emotional experience is very important in terms of the way we design trust in these networks. So if you receive the phone, you actually feel a sense of responsibility, right? You feel this sense of, I really shouldn't invade maybe their Instagram account. I really don't want to go in their email. 
maybe their calendar is safe. Right? So you have quite a lot of respect for their boundaries. And this forms almost um, very quickly. And if you're the person giving the phone, you actually feel incredibly vulnerable. Like, how is this person going to look and invade my life? And this is what trust architects look at. They look at this human emotion of feeling accountable to the other person, how they can bake this into these systems. And the way this often works is through these reputation and rating systems. Now, I am the first one to admit these are not perfect, but they are very powerful. And we are starting to get the research as to how they change behavior. So who uses Uber here? OK. Everyone, not Bitcoin, but Uber, we're OK. Now, how many of you are just a little bit nicer to the driver? Maybe a bit chattier, okay, about half the audience. This is an example of these ratings changing our behavior because you know that you're not just rating the driver, that you're being rated as a passenger as well. Um, I experienced the power of this when I was in San Francisco recently and I decided to take my two kids with me. They're four and two. So my dad said, um, I'll come with and I'll help you on this trip. This was a very bad idea. Um, but anyway, he realized when he got to San Francisco that it was hard to get around on public transport. So I gave him my phone with my Uber account. And I said, just press this when you want to get anywhere. He didn't realize two things. One, he didn't realize about surge pricing. So in two weeks, he spent over $1,000. He was taking over eight Uber trips a day. But the more interesting thing is when I got back home, no one would pick me up. Like I was requesting the drivers. <laughs> and so I called my dad up and I said, what did you do in San Francisco? And he said, well, I canceled a few trips. We were in the wrong spot a few times. Jack was sick in the car. Grace was screaming, so we didn't clear it up. Um, and there were a few trips that went horribly wrong. So uh, he damaged my reputation, right? He damaged my reputation score. And this is a very personal anecdote, but it highlights something really important that's merging, is that we're realizing trust is a very intangible thing and that trust needs a measure. And the measure of trust is reputation. And what's starting to happen is that this reputation is becoming very transparent in these systems. This reputation that is the sum, in the instance of Uber, of what all these drivers or what all these passengers think of us. And so what I'd like to spend the last 10 minutes on is some of the things that we're seeing, the implications that I think you need to start thinking about in terms of how this reputation may change the way we behave, may change the way business operates. So let me give you um, an example. I asked you at the beginning if you'd use UpCouncil. UpCouncil is a marketplace for lawyers. And the fascinating thing to me about UpCouncil is when I started to research them, I made two assumptions that were completely wrong. The first assumption was that it would be small to medium businesses using this marketplace because they couldn't afford to hire the big firms. And that was wrong. What I actually discovered was their fastest growth was Fortune 500 companies that were using it for two reasons. One, to um, contract their legal expertise based on real demand. And the second was, rather than hiring big companies to be able to find, right, I need an immigration lawyer that's an expert on Nigeria. So being able to find the exact talent. And the second assumption I got wrong was that I assumed these would be sort of second, third tier lawyers. It's not. It's lawyers with at least seven years of experience, Ivy League diplomas, who've made a conscious choice to lead firms and join these marketplaces. But the thing that's so interesting about UpCouncil, and my husband's a barrister, and I show him this, he's like, oh my god, this is going to freak the legal industry out. You rate and review that lawyer on every single interaction. If you dig into these rating systems, you rate them on how efficient their billing is. You rate them on how responsive they are. You rate them on things like whether you think their behavior was aligned to, um, sorry, if your behaviors are aligned in terms of your end outcomes. So what's happening here is really fascinating, is that those dimensions we're seeing in Uber are starting to extend to higher value services in our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying traditional trust proxies do not matter. Um, I teach at Oxford. I recognize that that brand is a trust proxy. But what's also happening is that a new type of trust is incredibly important to people, that we want the information how to decide how to trust individuals, not just institutional brands. The second thing that we're starting to see 
is how reputation has a real value. So let's play a little game. Imagine, I know this is very unlikely, but you are all gonna use blah blah car as a trust experiment. Raise your hand, you're a first time user, who would pick Anne? 90% of the audience, who would pick Beth? No one, and then there's a few people who are like, I'm never using blah blah car, so. <laughs> right, so we're willing to play the price premium. Let's play it again. Who would pick Beth? Who would pick Carol? Right, so this is true of the behavior we see on blah blah car, and it's really important because what we're starting to see is that reputation is in fact a new kind of risk premium. So insurance companies are really interested in all this data because they can actually use it to make risk assessments around people. So what's gonna happen is that our behaviors will start to be measured in real time. And the way we'll make risk assessments around people will fundamentally change and there'll be a price premium attached to those decisions. The second interesting thing that we're starting to see is how this online trust can actually change behaviors, make us more accountable. So let me share an anecdote with you. Um, this is, I'm trying to remember which hotel I was in. Oh, I was in the Disney Swans Hotel in Florida. Please do not go there, it's not a very nice place. But anyway, they have, you know those, sorry if anyone's planning a holiday there. Um, they have those rain showers. You know those rain showers? I don't know why. I like a door on my shower, right? Like the rain showers and then all the water goes over the bathroom. And so what I did was I just like threw the towels on the floor and as I was going out the room, and then I thought, no, this is really interesting and I'm always trying to document behavior. So I took photographs of this. And the reason why I took photographs of this was that I realized I'd never do this on Airbnb. So when I'm a guest on Airbnb, I spend the last three hours of my stay cleaning up and I leave the place better than when I arrived. And this is really interesting because what we're realizing is that um, reputation is actually an incentive for good behavior. So these systems aren't about weeding out the good and weeding out the bad, they can actually raise the behavior of everyone because they impact our ability to transact in the future. So I know that if I have a bad rating on Airbnb, it will impact my ability to transact in the future. So this is really interesting because online trust, because of these two-way ratings, we start to realize that online trust can make our behaviors accountable in the real world in ways that we can't yet even imagine. And you start to think of that principle applied to so many different industries where trust is broken and it becomes profound and also very frightening. The idea that you will be constantly monitored and held accountable for all your different actions as an individual and as an organization. It is a little minority report, but this is where we're heading. So just to leave you with one final thought, this is where we're also seeing a lot of innovation. And this is the idea of using reputation beyond the context within which it was created. So imagine you're a host on Airbnb. Um, this is a true story I'll share with you. Um, this is Kate Kendall. Um, she is a host on Airbnb, and she moved from Sydney to New York. Now, when you move, anyone who's moved internationally, you'll know that your credit history doesn't go with you, and it can be really difficult to get things like a lease or a rental agreement or a phone. So she was trying to get a lease, and she was really struggling because um, she had no credit history. She had no landlord. Um, she had no previous landlord recommendations. Or So she went to the um, rental company, and she said, I have 36 pages of reviews on Airbnb, and she printed them all out, and they gave her the lease. And this is what she tweeted out. You know, just got approved my 12-month lease largely based on my Airbnb reviews. And this is a beautiful illustration, an early illustration of what's happening in terms of how we will use this data to reinvent the way we make decisions about people that we won't judge people just based on a FICO score, but we'll start to use all these points of data to make different decisions about people. So my prediction is that over the next 10 years, that reputation will become a currency, 
a currency that will be more powerful than our credit histories. And this will have a massive impact in terms of the way we have to lead, the transparency expected of our organizations, but also how it will empower people to behave in different ways. So the thought I want to leave with you today is that if you think about the macro view of disruption and what technology has done, in the first phase, we saw a massive change in the distribution of information, like how information flows through society. In the second phase, and we're still in this phase, we saw a massive distribution in the creation and the production of value. And I think the third phase that is just coming is a profound shift in the way trust moves and flows through society. So the idea I'd like to leave with you is that perhaps the real disruption happening in the world isn't about the technology, it's how technology is changing trust in ways we've never seen before. Thank you very much.